China's in a rough spot right now. They might be without any emergency launch capability to the Tiangong station for months, which means they basically have no quick response option if something else goes wrong up there. Wait, what just happened? The launch of the Shenzhou-22 spacecraft on November 25th from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center marked the first emergency launch in the history of China's crewed space program. The emergency began when the Shenzhou-20 spacecraft developed a problem. Because of this, the three Shenzhou-20 astronauts had to return to Earth using the already docked Shenzhou-21 spacecraft instead of their own. Earlier in November, the Shenzhou-21 crew had arrived at the Tiangong space station and completed a smooth handover with the Shenzhou-20 astronauts, who had been living in orbit for six months. Under normal plans, the Shenzhou-20 crew was supposed to return home on November 5th using their own spacecraft. But on that morning, China's manned space engineering office announced a delay after discovering what was suspected to be a space debris strike on one of Shenzhou-20's portholes. The window's outer glass layer had a crack more than 10 millimeters long, and it appeared to have been pierced. Ji Qiming, a spokesperson for the program, explained, From one corner, it looks like it has been pierced through, but as the spaceship is still in orbit, we can't see it with our own eyes. We may be able to observe it more closely after the Shenzhou-20 spacecraft returns. The spacecraft's porthole has a three-layer structure, with the outermost layer being a heat shield. During atmospheric re-entry, the porthole must withstand frictional temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees Celsius, and the heat shield is the first line of defense. This crack essentially created a vulnerability in its safety. Because of the damage, the Shenzhou-20 astronauts had to return to Earth aboard Shenzhou-21 on November 14th. However, this meant the Shenzhou-21 crew, now staying aboard Tiangong, no longer had their own lifeboat in case of an emergency. To fix this, China launched Shenzhou-22 to provide a fresh return vehicle and end the temporary emergency situation. Meanwhile, on December 1st, the China Manned Space Agency announced plans to bring the damaged Shenzhou-20 spacecraft back to Earth for inspection. The goal is to gather meaningful real-world experimental data for subsequent missions, according to state news agency Xinhua. A specific return date has not yet been announced. So, it might sound like the situation wrapped up neatly, right? Unfortunately, the story isn't quite over yet. Even though everything happened suddenly, China's space program actually had contingency plans in place. Since the Shenzhou-12 mission, China has used a one-for-one -one rolling backup system. This means that every time a crewed spacecraft is launched, a fully prepared backup spacecraft stays on the ground, ready to go just in case. If an emergency launch is needed, the backup vehicle switches from standby to emergency preparation. That's exactly what happened here. When the Shenzhou-20 issue occurred, Shenzhou-22, originally the backup for Shenzhou-21, was already sitting at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. At that point, Mission Control's top priority was figuring out how to safely bring the Shenzhou-20 crew home. You might wonder, wasn't Shenzhou-21 unfamiliar to the Shenzhou-20 astronauts? Fortunately, China's crewed space program plans for this. The Shenzhou-20 crew trained on the Shenzhou-21 spacecraft before launch, and the Shenzhou-21 crew trained on Shenzhou-22 as well. This way, if the backup spacecraft has to be used, the astronauts already know how to operate it. In practice, this meant Shenzhou-21 served as the lifeboat for the Shenzhou-20 crew. Because Shenzhou-21 was about to be used unexpectedly, the teams needed to double-check its technical details and run through additional procedures. Crew-21 helped transfer supplies from their own ship, while Crew-20 moved supplies from Shenzhou-20 to Shenzhou-21 so it could safely bring them home. However, this emergency launch created a new problem a temporary gap in China's emergency response capability until Shenzhou-23 can be finished and moved to Jiuquan. According to a CCTV report, Shenzhou-23 was originally scheduled to be completed in March 2026 as the backup for Shenzhou-22, which was expected to launch around May. But after the Shenzhou-20 incident, Shenzhou-23's schedule has been accelerated by two months. 
It is now expected to be finished around January and sent to Juquan for assembly and testing. Only then will China fully restore its one spacecraft in orbit, one backup on standby safety model. To put it simply, China now has a new lifeboat docked at the space station, launched in just over half the usual preparation time. The next backup ship is also being completed months ahead of schedule. While they don't currently meet their normal safety standard of having an emergency spacecraft ready to launch at all times, they are moving quickly to fix that gap. Typically, two spacecraft are enough to cover all scenarios, one for emergency return and one for emergency abort. With the emergency launch of Shenzhou-22, China has accelerated the development of all upcoming spacecraft. As mentioned earlier, Shenzhou-23, originally planned for completion next March, is now expected to be finished two months early. Shinzo 24 is also being fast-tracked and is aiming for completion by next summer. Since astronaut crew numbers match their mission numbers, the next crew will be known as the Shinzo 23 astronaut crew. This means the title Shinzo 22 astronaut crew will remain permanently unused. And while speeding things up can sometimes be necessary, it's not always ideal. Shinzo 22's rushed preparation is a good example. Under normal circumstances, preparing a Long March 2F rocket for launch takes more than 30 days. Just five days before the Shinzo 20 anomaly, on October 31st, the Juquan Satellite Launch Center had finished launching Shinzo 21. One major part of launch prep is propellant loading. The equipment for fueling must itself undergo 36 hours of uninterrupted preparation, usually spread out over lighter workdays. In normal conditions, teams might work 10 to 11 hours a day, but in an emergency situation, nearly everything had to run continuously. Despite these pressures, another launch mission overlapped with the emergency. On November 19, 2025, right in the middle of the 16-day rush to prepare Shinzo-22, Juquan used a Long March 2C rocket to send the Shijian 30A, B, and C satellites into orbit. This satellite launch overlapped with Shinzo-22 preparations by 10 days, something China had not originally planned for. The surprising bright spot was how proactive and determined the teams were. He Pengju, chief engineer for test and launch at Ju Quan, said they were initially worried that pushing too hard might cause quality problems. But in the end, they managed both speed and quality. Every task was completed ahead of schedule. For example, the ship rocket tower assembly was originally planned to move to the launch pad on the morning of November 21st, but the teams managed to move it the afternoon of November 20th, reducing the pressure on the launch site crew. Once the emergency plan was activated, the Shenzhou design and development teams were just as busy. They had to simultaneously prepare for the return of Shenzhou 21, the emergency launch of Shenzhou 22, the later return of the damaged Shenzhou 20, and the accelerated production of Shenzhou 23 and Shenzhou 24. In other words, five major tasks were happening at once. The pressure was enormous, and the workload was non-stop. And because this was a crewed mission, the stakes were even higher. Losing three astronauts in orbit was no longer an option. Tasks that astronauts could normally perform themselves now had to be redesigned to work without their help. Some contingency procedures that relied on astronauts' operating systems directly were no longer viable. China had to update and improve many of its emergency plans to ensure the crew stayed safe throughout the process. In recent years, the amount of space debris in Earth's orbit has increased dramatically. This growing cloud of tiny, fast-moving fragments is becoming a serious threat to spacecraft, satellites, and even the safety of astronauts. Figuring out how to deal with this challenge and how to improve the protection of space vehicles has become a major problem that aerospace engineers around the world must urgently solve. In China's case, the initial assessment of the Shenzhou 20 damage suggests that the piece of debris that struck the spacecraft was extremely small, less than one millimeter across, but traveling at a very high speed. That's enough to crack a window in orbit. The return capsule adds another complication. Because it must withstand intense heat during re-entry, its exterior design can't include extra layers of protection or additional structures. This limits how much shielding can be added and makes debris protection even more difficult. What I'm really getting at is how little actual backup capability human spaceflight has right now. This isn't just a China thing. If you look around, nobody else is in a dramatically better position. 
Starliner doesn't keep a spare capsule on standby. Orion doesn't either. And even if it did, it only launches on SLS, which costs around $4 billion per flight and is tied up with a high-profile lunar mission that no one wants to delay. SpaceX is the only group that could plausibly maintain a ready backup because they actually have hardware, but if they were doing that, we'd definitely hear about it, and NASA would absolutely be paying for that service. At the moment, the only capsules flying frequent crew missions are Dragon and Soyuz. Soyuz technically has two vehicles docked to the ISS right now, but they don't have a fresh backup on the ground because their launch facilities are damaged. SpaceX, on the other hand, has five operational Dragons, with only one currently docked. So in theory, the other four could be used to reach the ISS and serve as emergency backups for both the Dragon crew and the Soyuz crew. China is basically in the same boat. They're not in danger, but they've already used up their redundancy. If things got absolutely dire, they could probably figure out a way to let a Dragon dock with Tiangong, but they would be extremely reluctant to do that for obvious political and technical reasons. And honestly, in a true worst-case scenario, no one on Earth keeps a backup capsule stacked on a rocket, fueled, and ready to launch on short notice. If it gets to that point, the crew is probably in trouble regardless of which country they're flying with. And yes, NASA would pay SpaceX to use a Dragon in a rescue situation. That's normal. CNSA also pays its contractors and suppliers. As for everything else people sometimes bring up, Dream Chaser is cargo only now and won't even visit the ISS on its first flight. Orion can't dock with ISS and is far too expensive to use as a rescue vehicle. And things like HTVX, Cygnus, ATV, Argo, and Nix are all cargo only and can't carry crew at all. In other words, backup options barely exist. That's just where human spaceflight is at the moment. Honestly, this is probably a big part of why NASA is hanging on to Starliner so hard. They want more options. With SpaceX and Boeing, NASA is trying to get what the industry calls dissimilar redundancy. It's one of those slightly overcomplicated phrases that basically means having a backup for your backup, but one that works in a totally different way. That's the whole reason NASA chose two companies to build two different spacecraft that do the exact same job. Human spaceflight is insanely complex. You're dealing with machines, software, delicate mechanisms, and literal fire-breathing engines, all of which have to sync perfectly if you want people to stay alive in space. One tiny component going wrong can be enough to set off a chain reaction that wipes out an entire vehicle. That's why spacecraft already have lots of built-in redundancy, backup systems meant to take over if a primary system fails. But dissimilar redundancy is a step beyond that. It's not just having extra versions of the same thing, it's having something different in case there's a flaw in the design itself. Regular redundancy is like having a spare tire in your trunk. Dissimilar redundancy is like also strapping a bicycle to the roof, so even if every tire on the car turns out to be defective, you still have another way to get where you're going.